Hi. Hi, Gabby. Perfect. Is... Peter, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm very excited about our interview tonight. Me too. Me too. I see a lot of people join in. I know. It's exciting. I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Perfect. Okay, so let's get started. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. Great. Okay, so first I'll introduce myself for the ones who don't know me yet. Um, my name is Gabriela Berospi, but I'm known as Gabby Wall Street because I'm the founder of Latino Wall Street, which is an educational platform that educates and empowers the Latino community to learn about the stock market. I'm also a member of the Forbes Finance Council, and I'm here to interview you, the expert. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm super excited about it. Um, you are the New York Stock Exchange most iconic broker, the Einstein of Wall Street is how we people- have the same thing. What was that? We have the same last name, Latino yeah. Einstein of Wall Street. We That's right. Explain it, go ahead. Same family. Um, You've also been called the most famous trader in Wall Street, the most photographed, and has been. you have been a stockbroker for almost three decades. Is that right? Or is Long, it over now? 35 years. 35. Wow. That's amazing. So I want to thank you so much for joining me tonight. Tell me, how is everything in New York City right now? You know what? I'm actually not in New York City. I am uh, up in Massachusetts, up in the country. Um, I have, uh, I was sick for a couple of months. I got the virus and I had COVID pretty badly for, for two months. And so, and I was separated from my family for more than 60 days. And finally, after I went through most of it, I have some residual damage. Um, I was able to reunite with my family who's been up here, um, uh, up in the country in the mountains. And so I've now been here for about a week, which is wonderful, trying still to recover from, from whatever this crazy virus has been. So, um, my uh the stock exchange opened it's super important for everyone to know we were closed from march 23rd to may 23rd and we have reopened it's a, there's a lot of new rules about it there's obviously we we were we were one of the last people to close when the economy started shutting down we we're one of the first people to open as the new as as the cities are starting to open up and i think it's super important to know that that we are we instill a lot of confidence. Look, I've gotten so much input from people all over the world about the closing of the exchange, me being sick, how much they really look forward to that human element on the floor of the stock exchange. Obviously, it's been that way for over 100 years. Everyone loves to see the people screaming and yelling, the emotionality, to see a human being between them and their money, stuff we'll talk about. So um, the stock exchange decided that it was super important to be the, at the forefront of the reopening of the city, reopening of confidence in the investment community. And uh, so last week, president of the Stock Exchange, Stacey Cunningham, first woman president in its 123 year history and the governor of uh, New York rang the opening bell. They were very strict about the way they did it to reopen only about 25% of each firm is allowed to come back to the exchange, six foot social distancing, plexiglass divider, temperature testing in the morning, uh, masks at all time, no, uh, no um, public transportation. So they, they sort of gone out on a limb to see that, um, that it's super important for the investment community, globally, domestically, that we reopen and that we're the catalyst to people getting that confidence back, that people can go back to work, that Wall Street's still there, the stock exchange, the NYSE, is going to be the first one, one of the first to open it. So uh, that's how it's gone. My son, who's one of my partners, um, was picked as the first team. We weren't able to do it together. Uh, he's part of the first team of Quattro Securities, the firm that I work with. And um, so they've been back to work now for a week. And the it's been quite noticeable, the difference speaking to customers, clients. Hi, hi, Mr. Um, um, how happy they are to people there. It's definitely muted. There's no question about it. Um, there's only about, you know, we have a team usually of about 800 people on the floor, brokerage firms, market making firms, DMMs, you know, the press and whatnot. It's about 80 people now. Their majority is safety for sure. Um, so that's it. We can talk more about that. You asked me how New York is. 
<laughs> you are not in New York right now, but you're giving us an intro um, about what has happened recently. Just on time for all the new people who joined, we have over 100 people right now watching. So that was fast, right? <laughs> the, the first couple minutes. Um, so you basically answered my first question, which was, um, we have a very interesting scenario, right? So we have a capitalist from Wall Street, but also a coronavirus survivor. So my first question, um, considering the protests that have been happening all over the world recently, how do you feel about the reopening, right? With what happened to you, but you kind of answered in the intro. Um, do you have anything else to add considering everything that has been happening and how people are violating the social distancing recommendations? So, you know, we've, there's so many, look, we've got so many pieces of this puzzle. First, we had the coronavirus come, the effect it had on the economy and the market, something else we should talk about because they're trading at complete divergence. So it's not following any standard that makes sense, but it is happening for a particular reason. And then we're obviously having um, the, the protests that are going on, which is another wild card that we need to, we need to talk about, but we'll do that in a little while. And um, I think that it's important that we open, and I kind of did answer the question, symbolically as the greatest financial institution in the world, that people see that we're there. There's that sense, once again, there's a human being. We are the only human element market in the world, right? That's something that we've, we've been able to sustain. It's super important. In a crazy volatile market, especially in a crisis, all the more reason to have human beings. So we want it to be there symbolically, economically, as far as confidence and whatnot for the investment community. As far as, you know, obviously we are all, you know, what makes this experience over the last two months and now, you know, the attempt at reopening and then now once again, what's going on with protests and Black Lives Matter and, and Mr. George from Minnesota, who was, who was ruthlessly murdered. Uh, we've got so many new dynamics going on. So we have an in the, and the timing could not be worse, even though this has been marinating for the longest time. We, we can get political and we can get start talking about that at another point. I think we should pro focus right now on our primary purpose. But what an unfortunate of events happening when we're trying to reopen the economy. Then what happened? And then once again, we've got an attempt to reopen. I, I do have an opinion about that, having experienced the virus. And how devastating now that we've now have protests where there are thousands of people who may be wearing masks or not, but it's sort of as if the virus has taken a back burner. And we would hope it would because what's happening now is, is, is biblical in so many ways. But, you know, it's important to note from being a COVID survivor that people seem to think that, and I see it a lot on social media, that there are two scenarios that live their, live their way out here that either you're old and you get sick and you die, and that we just have to sacrifice the elderly people to try and maintain the economy and, and everything. And then if you're young, you get sick and you get better. But mm -hmm. I consider myself young, so and I don't have any underlying conditions. I got a devastating uh, case of, of coronavirus. And what we're seeing is that there are hundreds of thousands of people who have recovered from the virus who have severe residual and collateral damage from the way the virus attacked them. And they'll be going on for the longest time. And I'm seeing it now with lots of neurological things, uh, physical things, um, surely spiritual and emotional things. So that is a problem that we're going to see as, you know, we were counting on this reopening within a safe, orderly fashion that we'd get a sense of being able to start business growing, markets uh, uh, reopening, uh, stores, restaurants, the economy per se. Um, I think we really need to address down the road a little bit how the stock market has made the move it's made. And I know there are a lot of people on there who are market and how the economy is and how the market is going up in, in, the, in, the, in the eyes of a complete global shutdown. But I think that I, I'm fearful that, um, yes, I wanted the economy to open up, I, I think it was while we watched Memorial be a day where throughout the country, you know, people were in the swimming pools and out on the beach and not wearing masks, and in my opinion, not taking it seriously as if the pandemic was over and it's not. I don't think we're out of the woods at all. 
And then on top of it, the, the unfortunate chain of events of what's going on protesting wise and thousands of people in, up in each other's faces. Yeah. And so my fear is that we, we may see a spike. Will it, you know, will it affect um, our attempt to reopen the economies? I, I believe it will. You know, um, I think as I watched the stock exchange attempt to create a safe environment to reopen, I was very well aware as we were on phone calls discussing with medical teams and with uh, federal and local agencies on how to do it safely, that this story about uh, the transmission of the virus, what happens to people wearing masks, social distancing, the attempt at reopening our economy is an ever evolving story and we still don't know so much about it. Yeah, and what's happening right now, it's, it's not gonna help. It's just, just keeps getting worse day by day and people are not just, in each other's faces, they're also fighting, there's blood, there's a lot of stuff happening. So it's leaving us with a lot of uncertainty and questions. Just to clarify, Peter, you're not in New York right now because you're still in the process of um, isolation and social distancing, or is there a different reason why you're not in New York? You know what, uh, look, I know uh, it's a couple things. I'm still recovering from the virus. I've got a lot of weakness and some issues that I've got to deal with medically. So that's part of it. Uh, the second part is that the, uh, I'm part of a company where uh, we are basically a team under a wonderful umbrella of a gentleman named Gene Morrow, who runs the firm. And we were basically given a certain amount of people allowed back on the floor. Everyone has a business within a business. And so my, my son and I being sort of partners in with one other gentleman in our um, trading strategy, only one of us was allowed. And it made more sense for me to defer to my son, who is actually a better typer and a little more focused at the moment, to basically go back to try to recreate the business trading model that we had going um, uh, until we go into phase two, which is probably more availability for people to come back on the floor. You know, the stock exchange floor, which at one point was five rooms, is now one room, the main room, right? Uh, and an amazing room. And I would invite all of you down there and you, Gabrielle, for sure, once the stock exchange is reopened to never open to the public, but to guests of mine who I've often brought down there. And many people on this uh, call have been, uh, have been down there and, and visited me there. Um, so those are two reasons. And basically I wanted to see my family. I had been, when I got sick, everyone was separated from me. Uh, my wife and daughter who have some underlying Conditions, I sent them away so they would not be in jeopardy. My son was under quarantine there. So um, I'm here still for a week. I'm going back to New York on Thursday for some, from, for some things. But I will be back on the floor as soon as they reopen phase two. Wow. Great. Thank you so much for clarifying that. So before I start asking you questions about how you got into Wall Street that a lot of people are curious about, um, I want to know your insights, and it's the questions we're getting through um, the chat about um, what do you think about the markets right now? It just seems like nothing makes sense. There's been fires and protests, and it seems like day by day things get worse, yet the market was very strong today. So a lot of people think of it as a bubble, right? We've heard the bubble metaphor that it's just going to get to a point where it explodes. And some people believe it's going to happen very soon, as in this summer. So how do you feel about that? Do you think it's basically impossible to know? Or do you see something happening soon, something drastic? So uh, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't recommend stocks. What I do on a daily basis is analyze what what the market's doing and why it's doing what it's doing and this has been and through whether uh, uh, my historic observation or um historic before me okay and in my very for the stock exchange um it's important to know what we're seeing here markets trade in concert with economies sometimes and then sometimes they trade completely and, and die posed, uh, yeah, I'm gonna make up some words because my brain's a little foggy. Complete dislocation from where the economy is. Let's go back for a second to, you know, a market that on February 20, uh, February 12th was at a record high. Unemployment was low. Companies were producing beautiful guidance and earnings. And, um, you know, we were, you know, 
I believe the administration, and I won't get political, was taking a lot of credit for it, even though I don't believe they would deserve the credit, but that's okay. Uh, that in February 12th, we were at record highs. Across the board, the Russell, the NASDAQ, the S&P, and the Dow were at record highs, 29,580, right? And, and 3,400 in the S&P. After three years, uh, whether it was the tax, tax reform, was the China trade deals, whether it was what's going on with Mexico, um, whether the money being pumped into the market, whatever it was, whether just a, a strong economy. Um, although, let's be clear, not everybody is participating in that strong economy, right? Mm -hmm. There are people who are not participating in this at all. But so let's go. On February 12th, we were at a record high. And then suddenly the reality of the virus started hitting our shores as first, obviously, from China, but coming across Europe and coming over to the United States, decimating economies and people dying throughout the world until it hit our shores, until it really became a reality around May 3rd, March 13th. And that was, that was the week that we saw markets really start to get, get hit very badly, right? We had circuit breakers on the floor of the stock exchange, which is something worth talking about at some point. You know, basically one of the great parts of having a human market with market makers and human beings at the point of reference and the, the restrictions well, or the rules that have been put on the floor of the stock exchange since 9-11 and Hurricane Sandy were that if markets were to trade off in general more than 7% on the downside, that the market would go slow and stop trading, hitting off a circuit breaker, and the market would, the, the people and the investment community would be given a moment to really get their ducks in a row, to assimilate the information, digest what's going on, see where the buyers and sellers are going, and then give it 15 minutes to really get a sense of what's going on and step away from the emotionality of a market that's in turmoil. And so we did that week of March. I believe it was, I know it was two, maybe even three mornings where we actually opened and closed simultaneously because the markets through the futures markets globally were trading down 7%. And I know there are a number of people on this call who took advantage of those one trading opportunities. All that being said, um, and the market proceeded over a six week period, fastest sell off in history to go from those highs of February 12th to March 23rd, which we sold off 11,800 points. The Dow broke 20,000. The S&P bro broke way below uh, 3,000. And we saw a fast and furious oversold situation that was a response to deaths around the world, global economies coming to a halt, you know, theme parks and airlines, and everything stopping dead in its tracks, right? On March 23rd, that was the low. And what ended up happening since March 23rd is an incredible 61 plus percent rally, okay, in the eyes of, of a complete global economic slowdown, in 40 million people unemployed, in one of, you know, to me, what appears to be a recession or a depression circumstances, which have yet to been borne out. But there are people, 40 million people in the United States alone who've lost their jobs. You've got oil cleaned off a cliff into a decimated situation. You've got this consumer in a position where it will take years before they're any level of, of, of the ability to consume, let alone have the confidence to go back out and into the economy. Yet, from March 23rd, we've seen a market go almost back. We've seen the NASDAQ recover all of its losses, the Russell recovering most of its losses, the S&P recovering a good percentage of those, and as well as the Dow. So why did this happen? Why? It makes no sense, you know, and I would no harm on the market, right? But my fear is, we know why it's, I mean, there are lots of reasons, you know, you're going to see on, on, on TV and in the press, a million, you know, economists and market traders and historians who are going to tell you what their opinion is, why this is happening. And in my opinion, I do, I'm a research guy, right? Um, I know I look like Einstein. I'm sure <laughs> yeah, you do. I'm not far as smart as he is. But it's clear that, you know, at that point on March 23rd, looking at this abyss that was our economy globally and domestically, the Federal Reserve and the government poured $5 trillion into the marketplace. We saw it in 07, and 07, 1.8 trillion was put into the marketplace over 18 months. And we saw the markets recover a little slower, surely, than they are now. And we saw big bailouts, and we saw, but eventually, if you're throwing, and so what's happening with this 
bailout or stimulus or whatever you want to call it. It's happening in a much shorter period of time. It's two and a half times as big as that one was. And eventually, if you throw, and, and also the Federal Reserve is building their, their balance sheet by buying bonds, by being all buying junk, by buying the market, right? And if you throw $5 trillion at a marketplace and companies, a lot of that money is going to find its way to the market. Right. And I believe that's what's happening. So I think it's a, it's a irrational enthusiasm. What, what's, and then you have people who are sitting there waiting for the bottom, sitting there short the market, sitting there waiting to pick a bottom, and they're seeing the market take off as it did fast and furious since March 23rd in two months regaining all these things. And then you have FOMO, your fear of missing out. All those people who start buying into that irrational enthusiasm. So, you know, uh, Anthony Scaramucci, who was once worked for Mr. Trump, who ran a hedge fund, called it a green tsunami. That if you throw enough money at anything, it's going to go up. And that this market is surely not up on fundamentals. And it's up on that, that stimulus. And, um, and unfortunately, I believe that most people are not participating in this rally. Mm -hmm. um, sure, they're the shoulda, woulda guys who told you they bought the bottom and they've made a fortune and they're going home to rest. Right. But there are two scenarios here, that the money is just going to keep getting pumped in, you know, and that we're going to, the, you know, this administration is running a re-election on the market's performance. So my fear is that they're going to keep doing that. And as I said, I don't wish harm on the market until November so that we still have a strong stock market and that he's able to run on that kind of euphoria. However, it's got, we've got to notice that never before have we seen in history a crisis where not a soul on this earth has not been affected in some form, economically, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and in every possible way by this virus. The world, the globe, right? And um, so I think it's important to note that, you know, we, we see a, a, an absolute lack of demand in everything. We see businesses, yes, yes, there were hundreds of billions of dollars given off to small uh, business. Uh, did right. the money get to where it should have gone? I don't think so. Um, but, you know, you read about what's going on, one out of four business uh, restaurants are going to open. Three out of four are not going to ever open again. Well, every 40 million people are unemployed. So my fear is once markets tend to get hyper-focused, you know, right now they're hyper-focused on the stimulus. They're not looking at what's happening, uh, the devastation that's happening economically by the virus and by the protests. Um, my fear is that the market is going to catch up with the economy and not the other way around. Obviously, I would hope that the market stays strong and that will give the, the backwind to the economy it needs and it will create new jobs. People will go back to work, restaurants will open, we'll find a treatment, you know, airlines will start uh, running, um, parks will open, stadiums will start, you know, having, having sports, sports arenas will go back to work. My fear is though, that when all this irrational enthusiasm stops, and the money, the money trail stops, and the reality of 40 million unemployed and so many businesses going bankrupt on top of what we're seeing now, you know, um, a dislocation in the attempt to reopen the economy. And then, you know, it's not like we're going to hit a switch and everyone's going to have the confidence to want to go out to a restaurant, go to the theater and do all that. So this will be a, quite a delay time on, on the reopening and surely the economic effects. Are. And then you're talking about economies that are, going to be, you're talking about businesses that in order to maintain the social distancing rules are only going to be able to run on quarter, on 25% occupancy. And most businesses in the United States don't make money on 25%. They need to be running on 80%, best case scenario to be making money and to, to be able to employ people, keep people going and whatnot. So my fear is that once all of this uh, stops, and you take your foot off the gas and you stop pouring gas on the fire that the world is going to that the market the world's already woken up and it's a nightmare but the market which is completely in its own world it is just living in bizarro world right um is going to suddenly oh my god you know um 
the, the hospitality industry, uh, the sports industry, the restaurant industry, the retail industry are going to be years before they get back on track. And it may be years before people are confident to go back outside and start spending. So that's where it's, I'm at. That's my fear. It's a very, very sad situation. And I actually thought people would be terrified to go outside. But now we added a wild card, right? That people are protesting. They're all over each other. We have huge riots and crowds. Do you think people are scared or do you think they've been suppressed and it's just a way of just letting all the anger and frustration out? So, you know what, it's always, I'm sort of reminded of that, the movie, The Perfect Storm. And uh, we've seen it in, in the markets too, where a market will get super hyper-focused about one thing. And then we've seen it on big, on big sell-offs, on big um, retractions of the market over time. It's one scenario, whether it's China trade story or it's this or that, and the market sells off, it really rebounds quite quickly. But when we have a bunch of things lining up, one of them was the inverse yield curve in conjunction with a trade problem with China that, that the president was creating, and then some other things. And we saw so many things uh, piggybacking each other that it really caused the market to sell off hard. Um, you know, let's just look at this scenario. Um, it, the, the, the press is putting a dark visual um, uh, image for us uh, about what's going on outside. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. I think people have been locked in their houses. I think this is a, 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 um, a recent story and a much more historic story. Right. It's a matter of what, 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 who you are, where you live and what your economic situation is. But, um, you know, have people on Memorial Day, you know, everybody went back to the pool and to the beach as if yeah. it was over. That was irresponsible. And we, we may see the, I hope we never do, but we may see some unfortunate manifestation of that. And I think it's going to happen here. Uh, you know, what's happening is a deep emotional um, fissure in our, in our society and, and, and it's driving people to the streets and it's murder and it's decimation of, uh, of a people's and a confidence. Um, you know, I think when you get to that point, people are not, they're, they're throwing, uh, there's a, probably an expression for it, I don't remember what it is, through the, to the wind. It's like, you know what, screw it. Screw it, I'm sorry you're using bad language. But uh, uh, what's happening is much more important than me getting sick, you know? And to a certain extent it is, because what's happening now is quite devastating and it's emotional and it's about, uh, it, it's about, uh, it's about people, it's about human beings, it's about survival, it's about everything. It's core and it's visceral. Um, but my fear is that, you know, you run out the door and it smashes behind you and you go out there and you fight furious and you're protesting and all that. And, you know, you end up going home at the end of the day and God forbid, you know, this virus is, is, is a devastating virus. And so um, there's, there's just, there's so many pieces of this puzzle, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not the one to tell people don't go out and protest. I think it's important. Um, I would surely uh, say that I don't, I think that we're, you know, we talk about it in markets, don't get emotional about it. Well, there's no way to separate from the emotionality of the devastation that was caused by what happened, the murder of, of George in Minnesota and a responsible way that it was handled and that, um, uh, and, and the way the fact is that we are lacking leadership in such a huge way that we are that that everyone is just out there and they got to get their message apart across so yeah. i don't think we uh i think we are just reacting emotion which i support and i get i'm just afraid of the repercussion yeah we're gonna have to face the consequences of sooner or later and i'm all about having a voice in fact i empower my community to have a voice and be heard especially because our community has been left behind historically. However, to fight violence with violence, it's a little bit of an irony. So I do encourage people to speak up, to have a voice, but there is no need to damage others, right? 
I agree. Because that's, we're not going to solve anything by doing that. So we've basically, the first half hour, we've covered what's going on in the world with the markets. Now people are thanking you in the comments. They're saying, I'm so glad that you're doing this. They're saying, Gabby, are you going to translate it later? I said, yes. Um, so they want to know more about you. So would you tell us, would you share with us how you got started in Wall Street, your very beginning? Okay, so uh, I grew up in New York. Um, I ended up going to college in the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Um, you know, I, I um, there's no business in my family's back, well, probably a long time ago. My parents are, uh, are Holocaust survivors. They came here in 1949 after they, and it's something that becomes, you know, it really plays a role in my response, my reaction to what's happening in the world today. So my, uh, my parents ended up, because they were Jewish, ended up in prison. Most of their families were murdered. My father and both my father and mother spent four years in concentration camp before they came here. Um, my father was a doctor and my mother studied medicine, but she ended up going to work with my dad. So, and I grew up in New York and went to high school, went to college, and in college, I thought I wanted to become a, um, a farmer. Uh, it was sort of an- Really? Art. Yeah, I had done a lot of things. I had done art. And there was a part of me that liked business. I had a t-shirt business and but I had this dream of, you know, it was sort of a, a, a hybriding plants and, hey, Frankie Moss. Um, and uh, I had spent a year actually abroad studying in Israel. And that was where I sort of, mm -hmm. my dream that I wanted to do sort of uh, uh, farming. And, and it's sort of not like be a farmer out on, the, on, the, in the, on a tractor, but to do some things uh, that way. And then um, I realized that that wasn't going to be my future. And I... I have an older brother who is a big deal businessman. He's much older. He was somebody that my father adopted before. Um, and he's in the uh, oil and gas business and a bit of a mentor for me. And he said, uh, he, he told me to get real and get a real job and start studying business. So while in college, I was getting a degree in international business, uh, economics. Um, and I graduated from college, uh, not the top in my class, I would say I was pretty down by the, by the low. Um, but I had a good business background by that point. And I was already starting to do small businesses at a t-shirt company. I'd been, I was doing all kinds of fun. I was a bit of a hustler. And I came back to New York uh, in 1980 and I started getting a master's in business in New York City. Um, I started trading the market actually. I started trading commodities uh, with some money I had been given and um, and I actually did quite well. You know, I was going to school at night, uh, getting my master's in trading uh, commodities, orange juice, uh, potatoes, stuff, whatever I could trade. And I, I did well. I ended up turning my small bit of uh, money into a bunch of money and then losing it all because I had absolutely no business. And I really, I had developed my own trading strategy. I thought I was smarter than I was. <laughs> I ended up losing it. So at that point, I ended up... Um, opening up a record store in New York and on um, Bleecker Street, 1981. And um, I opened a record company. I was managing jazz music for a while. I, was, I had an art gallery and a record store. And it was super great. Um, I modeled it after a European store. Uh, so we had a, a gallery inside. We had bands playing all the time. And, and I did that for a couple of years and a number of years. I started uh, traveling to Europe and managing bands throughout Europe and getting sort of a pretty good business background. And, um, uh, and then that was sort of, you know, I, I was not particularly focused. You know, I was trying everything. I was pretty good at most things I was trying. And then I ended up, um, I went away. I lived in West Africa for a while. Uh, wow, what did you do there in Africa? I was actually doing accounting. So mm -hmm. I uh, got an opportunity to run the uh, finances of a Norwegian oil company uh, in the People's Republic of Benin. And that was kind of where I sort of got serious about numbers and business and accounting. And accounting is not something I like at all, but I'm good with numbers and good with people. And so I spent two years there and then I went back to the States. And in May, May 23rd, it was just my anniversary, May 23rd of 1985, I got a summer job uh, on the floor of the stock exchange. Uh, was it an internship? Did you get in first by like being an intern or did you right away get hired? So it turned out I was very lucky. My father knew someone who had a, uh, 
who was the head of a brokerage firm, Cowan & Company on Wall Street. And he gave me this opportunity. You start at the bottom. If you're good, let's see how it goes. So there was, you know, getting the job was a privilege, but keeping the job was not. It was like, we'll, we'll give you the open door. We're going to start you at the bottom. And the bottom in that point, you know, the funny thing about the floor of the stock exchange is that um, there's no training for the job. You know, it's a job that engages people who are good with people, good with numbers, thinking fast on their feet. And my first job was to be a teletypist. Let's go back. It's 1985. Pre-computers, pre-cell phones, pre-anything like that. Wall Street was open outcry. There were numbers. We had things all done on paper. And I started that job from May till August. And I loved it. Once I got to the floor, as hopefully everyone will come to visit one day, the energy down there, people down there, the adrenaline down there worked. As you can see, I'm not like a sleepy, quiet guy. Right? <laughs> so the adrenaline really, you know, just filled me with, filled my spirit. And I love the people. And, um, you know, it's a kind of place where, you know, I always say this, if you find something you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life. I got down there, I found my place, I found my people, and it was wonderful. And I knew I was going to spend the rest of my life there. It was so, your passion, right? So you were just yeah. a natural. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. And when August came along, uh, you know, there was no, I guess it was an internship in a way, because, you know, they said, well, what do you want to do now? Do you want to stay? Go. Oh. And I begged them. I said, please, I would love to stay. I would love to have a real job here. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a shot. They said, okay, you know, we'll give you a shot. And I started, my next job was, there's sort of a progression on the floor of the stock exchange back in the old days before we had computers and whatnot, which was to become a phone clerk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was on the floor on a, in a booth connected to a trading desk. My first job is connected to an option trading floor. And that we, what we were doing is called option layoff business. When traders upstairs were trading positions in options, they would give us common stock and equities to buy, buy 500 shares, sell 200, cancel. It was sort of a fast and furious. I had about 30 phones and uh, it was amazing. You know, it was like you, it, you, you, you were thrown into the fire and if it worked for you, it was good. You know, if you're a person who needs to wake up, have a coffee and read the paper, uh, the floor of the stock exchange is not for you. Mm. You are somebody who, you know, out of the gate, you're ready to go. You hear somebody's voice, you hear numbers and you start to, you're on fire. That, that was me and that was, that was how Wall Street was at the time. And so fast forward, I was in the right place at the right time over the next two years and I went right up the ranks historically it took many years to go because most people didn't leave those jobs they were so good but i got lucky and i was a retail clerk an institutional clerk the different higher levels of the trading desk and then i did got my dream which was april april 18th i believe 1980 uh 87 uh to become a broker on the stock exchange i got a seat on the stock exchange and that was a big honor it still is but all the fanfare is a little different today. Um, and uh, I signed this book, which is sort of a, it's like Santa Claus's book. It's a book that was signed by the, you know, the Carnegie's and the JP Morgan's of the world. Wow. All, all the way back into the, into the uh, late 1700s, 1800s. And, um, and that was the beginning of my career. And, you know, I've, I've had many jobs down there. I've worked for different companies and I've, you know, I've tried institutional money. I've done hedge funds. I've been in convertible arbitrage, but the job of being a broker, the human, the human on the floor of the stock exchange uh, has been something that I've loved. You know, I go there every day. I love the people. Trust me, things have changed incredibly. At this point, I would say I'm one of the survivors and I see so many of my friends are, are on the call. Uh, we went from having 1600 brokers, give or take, and a support staff of, of, of thousands that it took to run the stock exchange before computers and even into the late 1990s and, um, and five rooms and thousands of people and open outcry and all the wonders that you see in the Wall Street movie and in the newspaper and in magazines on TV every day. And then you saw the sort of the event, of, the advent of, of technology coming in, in the early thousands or maybe late 1990s. I mean, I'm talking my started 
before the computer on Wall Street. Yeah, how was that transition? That was actually going to be one of my questions. How was that transition from how you got started, like the original way things were done, then all these technology-driven systems? So I fought it all the way. So the first transition, when we went from what was called the Quotron machine, which was a stagnant teleprompter, where you went from everything being done by, by hand, by little... You know, if you look at old photos of the floor, there was one old man sitting in front of a post. You, you know, stocks moved one or two, you know, uh, 15 cents a day and everything was done manually. Then you started having right pre-computer. You have teleprompters and whatnot. Crash of 87 was pre-computer. Um, and you started seeing a slower transition. Uh, you saw technology coming into the world and into finance, but it sort of made a slower road onto the floor because the the everything being done by paper, by, uh, by open outcry was one of those wonderful traditions that we wanted to hold on to as long as we could. And we did for a while. But as finance and as the global community started, you know, involving high frequency trading, electronic trading, different trading platforms, uh, handheld computers on the floor, computers in every part of our world and life, you know, mobile phones and whatnot, uh, that transition was a little more fast and furious. It was something I fought all along. I still don't own a computer. I, you know, really? I, have, I, yeah, I don't own one. I don't like them. Um, I was actually it's, the last. It's yeah. your first time going live. I wanted to share that. I forgot to say that in the beginning. First Instagram live. I love it. <laughs> I, I love it too. Uh, um, I was actually the last broker to go from having, um, from using paper, and I still carry the pad in my pocket to this day. Wow. Uh, to the handheld computer. I fought it in every way until they just said, you know what, this is happening without you, so you better jump on board or else you're gone. So I, I went through, I, I went along with it. You know, if you were to ask me, you know, am I happy the way it went? I would love to go back to the open outcry, to everything being done on paper. It's not going to happen. It's not particularly reasonable. Are there advantages to the new system? I think they've, you know, uh, not in my world, I guess, because I resisted. But I would think that there are, it's changed the nature of trading. We went from trading eighths and quarters to sixteenths to pennies. We've gone from paper to trading electronically. You know, um, uh, I'm not sure that's a, that was a great thing for the historic traditional markets, but it is, I hate the expression, it is what it is. Um, uh, you know, we've had to adapt to it, right? The unfortunate part of it is that that wonderful support staff of 1,600 brokers and thousands of people, whether they were market makers and the supporting staff of the, the specialists and all the supervisors and the, the squads and all the people that made up that incredible community of the New York Stock Exchange, which was the most philanthropic in the world, one of the great families of the world. It was a, you know, uh, uh, a wonderful divergence of cultures also. Um, not many women... We can talk about that also. That was a, a change in the 80s and 90s. Surely, historically, women have not participated as they should have. And Why do you think that is? Do you think it's just sexism? Like, what is it that women are left out in the... You know what? We, historically, well, the floor of the... Look, I think they've been left out of finance, surely, historically. For sure, they were left out of the floor of the stock exchange, unfortunately. Um, I think, uh, you know, the period of time... You know, there's one woman, uh, Muriel Siebert, who broke the ice in the 60s, 70s. She became the first woman to run a discount brokerage firm. There were very few women on the floor of the stock exchange, historically. Was it that the atmosphere was very male and, and macho and whatnot? It was sort of a boys club in so many ways, for sure. Was, was it all our fault? I don't think so. Was finance in general a male-dominated industry? For sure. No. Uh, answering Forget that. <laughs> that person. Okay. I, I, I got distracted. Sorry. Um, it was surely a, a, a male dominated environment. Um, do I think so? And it obviously took breaking that ceiling. You know, there were women that came down to the floor. Uh, there were a couple of circumstances we don't need to discuss that basically forced the Wall Street community and the New York Stock Exchange to start uh, adapting and bringing women down to the floor in all different forms and all the different job descriptions. And I would think it was one par, one point in the uh, probably late 80s, early 90s, where we had probably 100 women brokers. I believe that was the number. You know, yeah. so 
party. There were some wonderful, wonderful women who came down to the floor and also started at the bottom like everyone else and rose to the top and, and became brokers and were a big part of our community and I think changed it in a lot of positive ways. Um, you know, unfortunately with the advent of technology and whatnot, where I was going before you said that was that we've shrunk everything down through mergers, you know, what it took one broker to do, what it took 10 brokers to do in the old days can be done by one person with a handheld computer. So unfortunately through attrition, we've gone from thousands and thousands of people on the floor, men and women, to just a handful of probably seven or 800. And so that's unfortunate. And you know, are there many women on the floor today? Absolutely not. Are there many more women in finance throughout the world? No question about it. CEOs and CIOs, there's one beautiful one on this um, on the call from the company Switch, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, in finance, there are hedge fund managers. There are people running trillions of dollars who are women who are, hey, Jack, I love you. Uh, <laughs> there's a woman broker right there, number 411, one of the greats. I love it. Uh, she just happened to get on. It's so great. Hi. Um, so, you know, there are, I'm thrilled that uh, I can't change what goes on on the floor. It is a community that definitely grew as far as women go. It's definitely shrunken back down just by nature of, of the industry and technology on the floor. Um, but it's good to know, and I know so many of them, of women, surely there's never enough, but so many women in finance today who are doing some groundbreaking things who are in every level of finance, you know, mm -hmm. and I think the community that you're trying to, to educate and inspire, and it seems like you're doing it, right? Thank and, you so much. And everyone here is super happy and supportive about what you're saying too. Cool, I, I'm glad, you know, I work with a number of different companies that are trying to educate people as far as trading goes, mm -hmm. uh, educate women. There's a company called My Social Canvas, who I work with on the board that uh, is a Gen Z empowerment company for young girls, for, to, um, for career and mentoring, you know, and I know that a lot of the women I know in finance who I've engaged so sweetly um, uh, to ask to help to mentor young women that I know in to, to get some background and inspiration in finance, they've been the most uh, proactive in helping now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so, women, are, women are great. Women empowerment, I love it. So Peter, I'm an eternal optimist. I think anything is possible. I think if you have the right mindset and you work hard, you can make anything ca happen. I come from the third world. I accomplished the American dream. So I very much have that optimistic mindset. However, we have to be realistic. And even though I think at least anyone can accomplish and succeed in the finance industry or get to the New York Stock Exchange, start from the bottom, most people don't last. And I think that's um, the di big difference, right? Between getting to a certain point than to being able to last for decades in a position. So what are your um, tips or secrets? Because everyone here wants to know your, your tips, right? We, wanna, we want some advice uh, from a very wise person like you. So what would you say is the difference? What makes people, some succeed, and not last, and others be able to maintain that success and last for decades? That's, that's the ultimate question. And you know, there, there are many answers. And I would say, um, you know, that, that's, the, that's really the ultimate quest is to do that. Um, you know, I think, first of all, um, as I said, it's super important uh, when we're young to find something we love to do. Right, a job is a job. Is something you don't really want to wake up and go to, right? And so whether it's uh, where find out where you get your inspiration from, you know, whether it's a spiritual journey, a human journey, um, you know, uh, what where is your drive? What gets you up in the morning, mm -hmm. right? And and that doesn't always come naturally, you know. I mean, we can just sit around and wait for it to knock on our door, but that's really not going to be the case. So in my career, I mean, I have to admit, I've, 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 I've grew up in so, so, so much privilege, but I've, I've forged my own road in many ways. Could I have done it without all the people who came before me in my life and uh, the people who inspired me? Probably not. Um, you know, I could dip into the fact that my, you know, my parents came here as immigrants. They had nothing. They had just spent four years in prison. Everyone in their family was decimated and murdered. And they came out of a culture of hatred 
right? Very apropos, unfortunately, for the moment. And when I would ask them, you know, my parents were incredibly inspired people. And when I asked them, how did they get through what they went through? And they said, a day at a time. You can do anything a day at a time. They talked about, you know, um, always being a student, always being humble, um, but never give up that drive to find something that inspires you, you know? And that's not gonna happen sitting around at home, mm -hmm. you know? It may happen on a street corner. It may, you know, we always talk about, you know, we walk down the street, don't be looking at your shoes, look up. You know, you never, you may, you may find your vision in the most unlikely source. Don't cut off anybody. You know, wow. I've learned in my experience, in my journey, that I've learned some of the most amazing things uh, that have helped me in my life from the most unlikely source, people I didn't like. You know, wow. listen, listen to people that you don't like sometimes because wow. you want to, you, you know, it's, Intriguing to me that, you know, if somebody really annoys the crap out of me and when we're talking about business or about life or about wh whatever, it seems that if it really irks me to a point where I just want to walk away and not listen, maybe it's something in me that I've really got to look into too, right? You know, and there are different journeys on this path too. You know, I think, um, you know, I mean, I could get all spiritual with you too, which is, you know, it's a matter of being a really human being matter of being service, you know, of being of service, wow. you know, kindness is an amazing virtue, um, you know, not always needing um, uh, uh, to be recognized for the things we do. There's the spiritual part of it. And that's a big part of my journey. Um, you know, I, I uh, you know, never look down on anybody, you know, nobody is less than, right. And um, I'm, I'm known as that. I, what I love on, you know, look, I've been around for a minute. I've had many different, um, you know, I do lots of different things besides being on Wall Street. I'm trying to do some things through social media. I'm working with young artists. I'm working with young people. And, um, uh, you know, it's super important to me to always be a learner and to always, you know, be of service and to connect people, right? So this is a wild journey that we're all on, yeah. you know? And, and, you know, I also think don't take no for an answer. You know, reach out. There's some people on this call who I've known who were people who were sitting at home with seven bucks in their pocket and everyone told them they're never going to get anywhere and wow. you you can't call the CEO of that company or you can't apply for that job because you don't know enough. That's all horse shit, right? You know, have, wake up, pray and have some confidence and, and go out there and give it a shot. Unless you give it a shot, you'll never know. And maybe you're not going to get what you want the first time around, but it will give you that confidence. You're trying... We're building a, you know, a foundation here that will keep you going. So I love putting people together. You know, we can't do this alone. I'm a big team player, right? Uh, I didn't get here on my own. I got here by, you know, big backwind of team and people who love me and help me. Uh, I do that. I pay it forward in a big way that way, whether it's with my family or whether it's in, in business, whether I get it, you know, whether I get anything financially out of it or not, that's really not always the payoff. You know, to see people succeed in something and be able to be of service to them that they couldn't get on their own because I'm able to look at the big picture and introduce them to somebody, that's what it's about, man. That's where, I mean, that's where I get my gratitude, right? You know, and, and, and positivity, right? And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting a little spiritual on it and I think that's a big part of it because this is not easy. Right. And, you know, people who are now growing up with so many obstacles and so many headwinds, look what we're in at the moment. Right. And just that you can't give up. You've got, you know, knock on doors, reach out to other people. And, you know, when you get all locked up in your head with a lot of negative and shit, reach out to somebody else. There's guaranteed. I saw one of the most extraordinary things that happened when I got sick um, was that, I, you know, I was sitting at home having this experience all by myself. And it was quite a, quite, quite a, quite an experience, right? It was life threatening. It really took me for a loop. I was separated from my family. And, um, and but as I said, I've, I've had privilege in my life and I had a team of doctors who were there to help me. And, um, and I was grateful for all that, but I realized that there are thousands of people out there who were going through the same thing that I was. I wasn't God that damn special and did not have all the things that I had. And so I kind of reached out and shared my story on it. And it was amazing how much when you share your story about struggle, 
and about your your failures and your successes with other people. And I hope people are seeing it here today that somebody identifies. It's not a compare. You know, Gary B always says the worst word in the English language is compare. Don't compare yourself to anybody. Identify. Find some reason to be in this game, whatever the game is, and search for it. And then so purpose, about, right? Having a purpose. All about purpose. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and I love that because I always tell my community, we have to be open and receptive to always learning. And I love how you say, um, always be open, right? Because you never know what conversation is going to take you to a place where you would never be if you weren't open to it. So just having that mentality, that flexibility. And I love how you mentioned spirituality. We're very much spiritual in our community. However, I do think that's lacking, or at least that's what people think that's lacking in Wall Street. Do you think Wall Street is ego-driven? Do you think they need a little bit of meditation? <laughs> <laughs> not, not sure what I've gotten out of meditation, but uh, <laughs> you know what? Let's, let, there are different kinds of Wall Street, okay? You know, one of the great things about the floor of the stock exchange historically is we've sort of gotten a bad, ga a bad rap sometimes as those big bonus guys and those guys upstairs who are cutthroat and all they care about it themselves and whatnot. The floor of the stock exchange, which is called the street, the NYSE historically has not been, you know, there are, it's like an upstairs, downstairs thing, right? You know, as long as I've been there in a hundred years before I came around, the community, right, of the, of the people who formed the floor of the New York Stock Exchange were some of the most incredible and the most giving and kind people you'd ever want to meet. You know, there's, there are stories that you can tell having been around and it still happens to this day. And I know there's some people on the call who are part of it who we are huge people in as far as charity goes. Uh, we raise money every year uh, for Member Handicapped Children Fund. It's been a floor charity for, for, for 40 plus years. Uh, but historically, um, you know, it's about what you're talking about. It's community. What we can get done as a community, we can't get done alone, right? And so, you know, are there egotists and narcissists and people with swelled heads and people probably making some too much money upstairs on Wall Street? Absolutely. Um, you know, I m like to address the community where I found a home, which is the floor of the stock exchange. I did not work on that part of, of Wall Street. And yes, it's, I don't think it's gotten a bad, there, there's, there is a reality to it. And yes, there are lots of people in that community who do great stuff too. Um, but it doesn't have to be by nature an ego driven thing. You know, you're, we should delve into a little bit about, you know, trading. I mean, and confidence and discipline, right? The wonders that make a great trader. And I know also people on this call who are great traders will talk about that. But I think it's important to know that still to this day, even though we're probably about 800 people on the floor of the NYSE, and I, I feel blessed to have worked there all these years to be an ambassador of, of the human element in the finance industry and investment community, that you know, there are great people wherever you go you got to search them out and you got to identify, yeah. right? You can, you know, you can disagree on a lot of different fronts. Hey, we got disconnected. <laughs> anyway, there's a, there's a human element to it. That's super important. And, uh, you know, not everybody's one of that, that kind of a person either. You know, there are people yeah. who do better sitting in a cubicle and whatnot, but I, you know, you talked about purpose, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you know, he who dies with the most toys may not be the most happy. Right. And I think we're seeing that now, you know, this pandemic scorched the earth pretty hard. It got my attention. Right. And, uh, you know, and then now, once again, we're seeing what's going on in the world as far as the protests and, and the murder of, of George. And, and um, so uh, it's, you know, I, I think purpose is important. I think inspiration is important. Human connection is important. And you can find that in any industry. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely having a purpose, having a passion. I think that's key to succeed in whatever you're going to do. Um, everyone wants to know what are your tips, right? So like the best tips you can give us for people getting started, people who think this might be too hard, too complicated. They might think it's boring. Whatever the case may be, there's a lot of doubts um and fears people have regarding trading and finance what would you sell what would you tell them or what would you say to your 18 year old self when you first got started 
Oh, look, I think it's, you know, trading may not be everybody's uh, passion or, or um, future. Uh, I think the stock market per se has so many different nooks and crannies. It can be exciting. So unfortunately, we can't go down to the floor of the stock exchange and do a walk around now. But, you know, for me in my life, marketing, advertising has been a super exciting, uh, intriguing thing for me, something I would have gotten involved in if I had not gotten involved in in the markets. Mm -hmm. So if you, uh, you know, and availing yourself of as much information and education uh, uh, as far as uh, finance goes and markets, forget finance. Let's talk markets for, you know, there are incredible opportunities now, you know, to wake up in the morning and watch hundreds of different TV shows that talk about finance and markets, you know, online or a network, uh, CNBC or, you know, or online the street or whatnot. Uh, these some very many people in the industry who made a lot of money are now involved in educating younger people about markets. It's not all just about making money. It's about being community, right? Whether it starts, and I do this all the time, I give tours to young kids as young as, you know, kids who started in, uh, I started it with my, my uh, daughter and my son's uh, elementary school or junior high school class where um, uh, they would come down to the floor and we would talk about doing virtual trading. You know, you'd be amazed, and I'm sure you may see it in, in your community that's, uh, that follows you, that there are kids out there, 12, 13, 15 years old, who are already, you know, they're, they're buying sneakers and selling them. They're uh, trading stock, virtual trading uh, contests at school. You know, they're asking their parents to buy them, you know, one share of this, one share of that. They're watching uh, um, finance television. Um, you know, they, they know a lot more. When kids ask me what I, for a tip, and I ask, they ask me, what should I buy? And I just say to them, I said, that's the question I would ask you, because you guys are the consumers. And the market wow. consumerizing, ba consumer-based market. So I said to them, if you want to know what to invest in, walk down the street, look at kids your age or older, see what sneakers they're wearing, what clothes they're wearing, what phone they're using, what social media they're on, and what computer do they use? And the answer is going to be, you know, Nikes, Apple, la la la, you know, and what are you watching? Disney and ESPN for sports, right? And um, that's not every kid. But if you walk down the street, you're going to see that. And those stocks have been some high flying stocks, right? So, you know, it's a matter of availing yourself of information, walking down the street, looking at people, you know, seeing what gets you excited, find something to excite you uh, in. And there's so many nooks and crannies in the finance world, in the stock market, where you can find something that intrigues you, that excites you, whether you're excited by, a, you know, a clothing line that you wear all the time. And then you're like, you start investigating who they are and what they do. Another thing we should talk about at the end of this question is sustainability and ESG sector of companies, you know, companies that are doing good, right? But anyway, but you know, maybe, maybe it's sports, maybe it's gaming, maybe it's the sneaker world, you know, maybe it's um, any number of things, you know, maybe it's retail, maybe it's hospitality, but the, the stock market is made up of these companies that we have a personal relationship with every day. Just think about it. I love going to the floor of the stock exchange and seeing the logos of all the 5,000, 3,800, 4,000, whatever stocks there are. And when I bring visitors down and we have one of the ticker tapes just has the logos going by with the last sale. And people, whether they come from anywhere in the world and come visit me on the stock exchange, whether they're 12 or, or 90, they recognize every one of those logos because it's a part of their lives. Yeah. Clothes they wear, the phone they use, the computer they do, a cruise ship they took, the, the last sports arena they went, you know, the, 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 you know what I'm saying? So all those things, yes, it may seem intimidating because it's the floor of the stock exchange and it's the stock market and it's for rich people. It doesn't have to be that way. You, we are all consumers of stuff that make the companies down there run, give them earnings and guidance, and that's why they're there because of us, we are consumers. And our society is, is a consumer-based society. So just go out there and find stuff that, you know, there's a reason we 
buy a phone, buy a computer. We're very loyal beings yeah. right? uh, in, in our consumer world, right? We always love the same kind of sneaker. We love the same phone. You just, no, don't tell me about that. I got this. So then, you know what? Do a little research. Find out w what it is about that excites you. And then just sort of broaden it. And there may be somewhere along the way, you know, this is, we need to be driven to find out what we love to do, what gets us up in the morning. That's what you want. It may not happen to everybody, but I know, you know, it's, the, the brain is a muscle. You've got to train it. You got to get up in the morning and go out there to try and find stuff that makes you happy. You know, whether it's in a human relationship, that's a big part of it. But in, you know, we all got to make money. We all have to have careers. We've got to be involved in something. And so it's important to do. Yeah, you couldn't have said it better. That's what I always say and people were just sharing that how it's not brain surgery, right? Like you just have to pay attention. What are people doing? What is most of the world, not just in the US, right? But if you walk around to have a coffee, you have Starbucks, you go to China, you have Starbucks. So there's patterns that we just have to open our eyes and pay attention. And we also believe it's not just for the elite, for the 1%. We can all participate. We can start small. I love how you mentioned teenagers. We've also had teenagers participate and learn. You know, it's, it's an amazing opportunity, I think, to be young in this digital era because now you can have access. Like, there's a teenager right now who can be watching us because he just clicked on Instagram Live, whereas before, you wouldn't be able to have access to this conversation. Correct. I think it's important to note right now when we're talking about this that so there are going to people who are going to be watching this and who are plan, trying to plan their career and whatnot. Then there's some who are just intrigued by trading, right? Trading is super exciting. It's an amazing discipline. Okay. And there are people on this call who are masters at it. And I know your organization has somebody who teaches people day trading. So there's a difference between trading and investing. Let's be clear about that, okay? You know, you look at your parents invest, we would hope, or people who look for long-term, you know, whether anybody has a job and they have a retirement fund, it's in the marketplace. That's long-term investment. But we have an opportunity these days, which we've never had before, for young people or anybody who is now has money, whether it's small, it doesn't matter how small it is. And I'll talk about fractional investing because that's the name of the new game here. But um, there are trading schools. You have one. I have one. Okay. You know, this is not a game, right? This is real. It's a discipline. It's something you have to learn to do, right? And so there are people who will, you know, will look at this and, you know, maybe it's their calling, maybe it's not. But there may be a lot of people on the call who are super interested. So how can I take my, you know, $500 I earn doing whatever it is and make some money on a daily basis? What do I do? So there are you, I know you guys have a, have a, a gentleman who, who trades uh, in Spanish, mm -hmm. uh, how to day trade. Day yeah. trade is a discipline, okay? And there's a friend of mine on, David Green, who you spoke to today, who yeah. also teaches in English, who has yeah. a trading school called the Green Room Live, where you can go on and learn on a webinar how to day trade, right? Stocks go up and down for reasons. There's technical reasons, there's long-term reasons, but trading, the whole point in trading is, is to make money. Right. Now, it can be, have a bigger picture. It can get you into the industry. It can make you independent financially. There's all different reasons. But what's fascinating is it's a discipline that you need to learn. It's not for the slight part, especially in a bit of a crisis. So we'll offer information to anybody who wants in Spanish and in English, those watching us and whatnot who want to learn the game. It's it's not a game, sorry. To, <laughs> to learn the art of day trading, there are people out there, as I mentioned, David Green, Green Room Live, and your person, uh, I suggest they do that. But yeah. what's fascinating is there's going, they've, they've instituted recently um, something called fractional investing. So uh, one of the companies, My Social Canvas, which I'm working with, we are creating a financial arm, which will be an app where people will be able to uh, pull up an app and, and trade through their iPhone. You have them now. There's Acorn. There are a bunch of different, you know, there's there's uh, um, uh, there's a bunch of different ones. I won't mention them. Was it Robin? One that's not been that successful. But anyway, so in, in, uh, 
in this recent time, they have been able to develop the technology where you can actually buy, you know, Amazon trades for $2,000 a share. Google trades for $1,000 a share. Apple trades for $300 a share. So people who don't have much money think, well, I have to invest in penny stocks because I can't afford it, you know. And that's sort of a, that's a, has been in the past perhaps the way it is, but unfortunately it's not, it's fortunately, it's not the way it has to be now. So there are actual apps now. People can look them up online. Uh, that is fra called fractional investing, where you can actually buy $10 worth of Apple, $10 worth of Google. You can put $50 in and buy a sliver share of all the high flying stocks. And you can sit there and watch it. My dream is that young people today, as opposed to just, you know, I, I say invest, invest in stocks, not stuff, is something mm -hmm. to say to young people. You know, we're big consumers. We need the next iPhone. We need the next sneaker. We got to get that next shirt. You know, and often, you know, we have to think about our future. You know, we have to think about investing in ourselves, right? Nothing is insured here, right? So uh, assured, not insured. And um, it's wonderful to see in the people that I've spoken to and taught about this, how excited they are when they put $5 in Acorn or they do it into one of the fractional investing apps and in 10 days it's $12 and they watch it go to $20, right? That excitement you get from the next iPhone or the next pair of sneakers is not maybe a little bit of immediate gratification, but to actually build yourself a future and invest in yourself, right? Which may help you find your way in this journey is super exciting. So those are all opportunities we can talk about again, further down yeah. the road. There are great opportunities as far as a lot of opportunities, a lot more to learn, whether you want to learn English or Spanish. We're going to be having more conversations, collaborating more. We have something with David coming up. So guys, um, stay tuned. I have the very last question. It's yeah. a bit intense, but <laughs> I'm very curious. If you went bankrupt and had zero money, what would you do? That's a good question. Um, if I went bankrupt and had zero money. It's happened for a lot of people, you know, a lot of people right now are at zero. So I'm just curious, like where you go from zero, right? Do you just like go back to your dreams that you once gave up on? Do you do something crazy like for you, if that happened to you? So for me, look, I've actually, look, I've had, I'll tell you one thing. So uh, my career has had its ups and its downs, okay? And yes, I've had, you know, people behind me who've supported me when things, you know, were not as good as, as they are today. Um, I have to admit the one, th the, there was a period of time during 2006 and 2007 where I went through some crisis and I, uh, I lost my business on Wall Street. And uh, all I wanted to do was just hide under the covers and never go in, you know. And I don't know whether what it was, you know, um, uh, it was a determination that, you know, as I mentioned before, that, you know, opportunity is not knocking on my door. I have to go out and find it. And so I actually went to work. I got up and got dressed and went into work and kind of faked it a little bit that I had business for more than a year, you know, and I just went and I showed up. I wow. said, no, I'm not going to run into any opportunity lying in bed, cowering under the covers. So I got up, I hopped on the subway and I went down there. And I found, put myself at the corner of walk and don't walk, you know. I, 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 I kept my eyes open. I looked for the signs, right? And eventually, and I didn't make the money for a year and a half. And I kept going in. I didn't let people see me sweat. You know, I'm sure I asked some people for help. My family and whatnot gave me somewhat of a cushion. But I was, I, I was determined to try and make it on my own to a certain extent at that point. And eventually, that opportunity showed up. Uh, you know, on a subway one day, I ran into a guy who had been in a similar crisis as me. I had known him years back and we kind of connected and he goes, what are you doing? I said, you know, I'm going down to Wall Street, but I don't have anything going on. And he goes, oh, I'll give you an opportunity. And we connected and we ended up running a business together for 10 years. Wow. So, from the subway, someone you met randomly? I okay. known in the business years ago. Who oh, I had seen. Okay. But I know that sleeping, hiding under the covers, I would have never run into him. 
So, you know, if I were to lose everything and go bankrupt, I, you know, I'm sure I would be fighting the darkness and the negativity and the fear, you know, fear and anxiety are, 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 are dark places, right? And the only way uh, out is through, right? You know, um, one of my great premises in my life, you know, that if I was able to get the wherewithal to do it, and if I couldn't do it myself, I would reach out to another human being to try and, 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 and give me the inspiration. I'd get up and I'd just start walking down the street looking for opportunity, you know, and they're out there if you search for them. And I know that's sort of a kitschy thing to say. And, you know, I'm sure there are people who have tried to look for work and never found it. And they feel like they've gotten the shit end of the stick. But at the end of the day, nothing's going to find its way up into your, you know, find you under the covers there, except, <laughs> dark, except darkness, you know, get up and pray and have faith that it's going to be okay, you know, and go out and search for opportunity, you know, and then if not, you know, another thing that I found, and I'm seeing it a lot in, um, in this sort of struggle of times we're seeing now, I have a number of friends who are, who, whose lives are, are consumed by being of service to those who have less than them. You know, and uh, there's a company I work with called PCNY. And these are people who, who, who have given away 200,000 pounds of food to food banks so, so during the pandemic. Every day they drive trucks up from, from the South to New York to give out food. So one of the other great spiritual premises is, you know, that if you are not, have not been able to find your bottom or your, 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 uh, vision or your miss mission yet is to go out and help another person. Wow. Right? It's that to take the focus off ourselves, put it on someone else, you know, go out there and be of service to someone else, you know, and, and, and you'll find the light. The light will show up. I promise. You'll discover what, what your purpose is and what makes you feel alive. That for me, that's the number one thing. And just to close, I always tell people, you know, I'm never interested in having a conversation of, why we can't do something what's not possible but quite the opposite you know what's possible that's how i open my conversations what can we create here what's possible because i truly believe anything is possible so thank you so much peter for inspiring us for all your wisdom people love you you have a new fan club <laughs> They want you to, to do this again. So we'll be getting creative and we'll be staying in touch to bring more um, educational content for everyone. I look forward to it. Me You're too. Welcome. Anything I can do to help would be great. Thank you so much, Peter. Have a great night. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Do I get to see all these things people are saying to me now? <laughs> you could scroll. Oh, I recommend you save the video. It will prompt you to say um, delete or save. Save it. And I can also um, have all the people who couldn't make it to watch the recording. Awesome, I look forward. Can I scroll down? Yeah, you can scroll up and down. There's actually a lot of, a lot of comments you might wanna read, both in Spanish I'll, and English. <laughs> I'll bet there are. Okay, awesome. You're wonderful, I'll see you soon. <laughs> see you, bye.